morning to all of you. I'm so glad that you decided to join us again on this Saturday morning. Uh, wherever you're from, we are incredibly grateful that you're honoring us with your presence. Here in uh, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, we are finally seeing the end of the cold and we have finally receiving some nice and warm weather. So wherever you're from, I hope that that's the case for you as well. We're glad that you decided to join us. And today's uh, talk is entitled, uh, Of Powers and Kings. I invite you this morning to open your Bible to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. I know there's a lot of very sincere people um, today who have a very bewildered attitude towards the book of Revelation, and understandably so. There's a lot of beasts and grasshoppers and dragons, and, and uh, it can lead a lot of people to be confused and basically just say, you know what, I, I'd rather just not look at it because uh, it's just too confusing. And um, it's impossible to understand. And uh, <clears throat> I understand. I, there are certain things in his book that myself I am still learning and still searching. So you're not alone. I'm too. But if you go to Revelation uh, chapter 14 and you go to verses 9, actually I might even have it up on the screen for you, but uh, verses 9 to 10, Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 and 10, uh, I think this is probably one of the most serious verse that's ever been written in the Bible. And it goes something like this. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with it without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, folks, this is, this is a very serious and I would say life-altering uh, altering verse uh, in the Bible. It really affects uh, humanity's destiny. And the question I want to raise to you this morning is, um, would God, a God of love, and would he be just and fair and good if he sends us a message like this, but doesn't identify who this beast is? Let's say I tell you a message like, um, if you worship Lala Goshapur, I'm going to put my wrath upon you, going to destroy you, and you're all going to go to hell. If I have any credibility at all, your next question will most likely be, who is Lala Goshipper. Tough, and if I tell you tough luck, you'll figure it out. I'm not going to tell you. What kind of person would that make me? Not very nice. A lot of people treat God that way. They read the book of Revelation, and it says this, it says that, it might say this, it might say that. Folks, if God's going to put a verse like this in the Bible, he is going to give us the interpretation. He is a God of love. He's not going to leave us in the dark. And too many have made this verse and everything else around it in the book of Revelation so confusing that people have become afraid of this book. And I hope that today you can understand more. And as we go on, what this book is actually taught. What we're going to learn today is actually going to blow your mind. You know, the fact is that the book of Revelation is a very straight and honest book. And it gets into some very sensitive areas. For example, today, we're actually going to identify a religious entity. We're, really, we're going to learn that we are also going to be talking about a religious power. A, a power that the Bible says all the earth will worship, and all the earth will follow. Revelation talks about kingdoms of the world. It identifies different powers that rule. It talks about different churches. And most of all, Revelation exposes a lot of error as it shines light on Jesus Christ and on truth. That's why if you open up the book in 1.1, it says, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, you know something, I've... I, 
Today, the world is full of deception, as you're going to learn. And then I think the book Revelation is the opposite. It's a revelation. It opens up to us what's truly happening around us today. And it makes me sad that some people believe that that book is actually not relevant until after some rapture, some secret rapture. And, and then after that, the, the, the mark of the beast and all these things, the image, that's all going to be after. And there's so many people today that believe this. It's a sensitive book because sometimes this truth hurts. But error and deception hurt a lot more in the long run. So let's get a foundation on how we are to correctly interpret Bible prophecy. In 2 Peter 1.19, this is near the end of your Bible, almost at the end. Uh, Peter was one of <clears throat> Jesus' disciples and uh, wasn't a very well-learned man. He was a fisherman, but yet he wrote some pretty profound things. And here he says, and so we have the prophetic word, so revelation, uh, confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It says a prophetic word confirmed. There's no guessing. There's no wild speculation. There's no sensationalism that we see in some churches today. It is simply straight Truth, it is sure, it is undeniable, and it is indisputable. It says later on in verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretations. It means that it's not up to you, it's not up to your church, it's not up to your pastor or to me. What anything means, it has to be explained by the Bible and the Bible only. And then he goes on to say, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we have to lay, ground, lay down some ground rules today. First and foremost, we are not, we talked about this last week, we are not going to interpret Bible with one or two verses. We're going to use the whole of the Bible and we're going to try to support everything that we say uh, to the best of our ability with as much of the Bible as we can. And then secondly, there's a lot of what is taking place today in a religious community is called prophecy, but it's not. It's really not. It's idle speculation. In fact, there's one very popular preacher today on the networks, and I'm not going to say his name, but he puts out a new video every three to four months. And if you look at those videos over the last 20 years, he actually uh, un unsays some of the things that he said 10, 15 years ago. He actually contradicts himself as the times go forward. And people who listen to him are actually confused. There's great inconsistencies in a, Christian, in a Christian world today when it comes to understanding the book of Revelation. I mean, it almost seems like every time the president of the United States sneezes, there's some prophecy that appears out of somewhere in the Bible. I remember, for example, Desert Storm. This is a while back. You know, with Saddam Hussein and when he invaded Kuwait. Um, within three months, there were 20 books in the Christian bookstores. And all of them were bestsellers best saying that this is Armageddon, and that Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist, and then this is the end of the world. And here we are today, several, several years later. You probably laugh your head off reading some of those books now and seeing some of the predictions that they've said. There's a lot of guys making money, a lot of men and women making money off of gullible people. But God says, if it's prophecy, it's going to be confirmed, undebatable, and undeniable. So, Let's have a look at uh, this strange beast in Revelation chapter 13. This is the beast that talks about in Revelation 14, the verse that we just read. Uh, let's have a look at this beast. So go to your, to your Bible. We're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Revelation today and also a lot of time in the book of Daniel. So if you have bookmarks like I do in my Bible, uh, you can just bookmark Daniel chapter 7 and then bookmark uh, Revelation 13. And if you're old school like me, because most people just have their Bibles on a device now. I don't even know if you can bookmark on a device. I never, never tried. Yeah, so uh, if you can, bookmark Daniel chapter 7. So anyways, let's look at this beast. Um, 
in, in, De- in Revelation chapter 13. And uh, it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, his horns, ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. See, I told you, this kind of stuff is, is weird. It's kind of creepy. Uh, but there is a meaning and a purpose uh, to all of this. Um, and, and this is actually just a, kind of an artist rendering. This is not actually what he saw, but just somebody who read this and kind of made, made a picture uh, of what this was. And if we keep reading, it says, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And then the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, this is a strange looking thing, to say the least. The one that God says don't worship, don't receive its mark, and don't, uh, don't bow down to its image. Now, folks, have you ever seen anything like this in the zoo? In your local zoo? No, of course not. This is symbolic. This is assumed. I've never seen anything with, you know, seven heads and, and horns like that and with crowns. Obviously, we haven't. It's a symbolic animal that represents something. So let's see what it all means. And in order for us to be able to identify a few of those symbols, we need to identify a few symbols before we can actually understand this beast. For example, water. Because it says, I stood on the sand of the sea. And some Bibles say it came out of waters. And so what, what does water symbolize uh, in the Bible? And if you go to just a couple of pages over, Revelation chapter 17 Verse 15, it's pretty clear. It says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw were where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So even though this is specifically talking about a harlot that is being talked about in Revelation chapter 17, this harlot also came out of the sea and out of the waters. And so it gives us interpretation here that waters is peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So Simply put, the beast is going to come up out of a populated area of the earth where people speak many different languages. So this is clue number one as to understand who and what this beast is. But there's more, like it has a body of a leopard, it has the head of a lion, and then it has the feet of a bear, and then it has these horns. Uh, What on earth does all that mean? And in order for us to interpret this, We have to go to the book of Daniel. And so go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. And we're going to spend a little bit of time studying this book. Because uh, like I've told you before. Daniel is is the companion of Revelation. And they talk a lot about some of the similar things. So if we're going to spend about 30 minutes here in the book of Daniel. um, And and so like wherever there's something in the book of Revelation. There's a pretty good chance it's going to be in the book of Daniel. And vice versa. So remember last week we studied a prophecy in the book of Daniel. It was Daniel chapter 2. And uh, if you remember, it was a statue and it had metals and it had feet with toes. And then it had, you know, different metals all the way along. Um, And so um, there's going to be a parallel here between Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. So let's take it apart. Daniel chapter 7, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream in the visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. So in Daniel chapter 2, is the king that had a dream. And Daniel interpreted it. Now in Daniel chapter 7, it is Daniel that has a dream, but he dreams a dream and he also dreams the interpretation. So now he's about to write down what he dreamed and what it means. He says, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision, verse 2, by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So the sea symbolizes people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. What about the wind? Uh, In the Bible prophecy, the wind symbolizes strife and war. And I'll give you a couple of verses for you to look up if you wish. In Proverbs 11 verse 29 and Ezekiel 5 verse 12 shows to us that whenever the Bible talks about winds, it's talking about 
a time of unrest or, or war or strife. And so we know that this beast uh, is coming up out of a populated area where there's turmoil uh, on the earth at that time. So uh, then we read in verse 3, it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Sorry, we're not talking about the beast of Revelation 13 here. We're talking about the beasts. And we're talking about four beasts that came up out of the sea, out of this populated area. So what does a beast represent in prophecy? Because that's also very important. We have four of them here. We want to know. And again, we don't have to guess. Uh, the Bible tells us what they are. If you just go down to verse 17, it tells us those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. So, they're kings. And even if you go further into verse 23, it says the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. And so, a beast is either a king or a kingdom, or a king and his kingdom. And we do this a lot, right? I mean, for example, what animal represents the United States? Right? An eagle. Right? What, what animal typically represents China? Some form of a dragon. What about Russia? A bear. And what about Canada? A moose! Or a beaver. You know, all these countries have these aggressive predators. And here in Canada, we have a moose or a beaver. Uh, I, don't, I, I still don't get that. I mean, teams do that, right? You have, you have sports teams. And like here in Toronto, we have the Raptors. And then you have the Nashville Predators for a hockey team. And you got the Seahawks. And you know, all these, all these teams are choosing these animals that are ferocious and, and aggressive and winners. We do it today. So did it, uh, God did it in those days too. And they did it in those days too. So how many beasts came out? Four beasts. Just out of curiosity. How many medals were there in the statue in Daniel chapter 2? Four. Gold, silver, bronze, iron. Four beasts, four kingdoms, four medals, four kingdoms. If we read in verse 4, it says... The first was like a lion, and he had eagle's wings. I watched till his wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Do you remember from last week's sermons who was the first kingdom in the statue, the head of gold? Ah, I don't expect you guys to remember this. This is, a, you know, this is history, right? This is, this is, it, it was the kingdom of Babylon, and the king was Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure that some of you decided to name your new baby Nebuchadnezzar after last week's sermon. Um, and so Babylon was the head of gold. And it's interesting, as you read in the Bible, that the symbol of Babylon is a lion. There are several verses. You may want to jot these down. I'm not going to read them. Jeremiah 4, verse 7. You have 2 Kings 24, verse 1. And you have Jeremiah 51, verses 37 and 38. They actually label Babylon as a lion with wings. But that's not enough. Archaeology has proven that this is how the Babylonians depicted themselves. There are hundreds and thousands of artifacts that... that that were part of the Babylonian culture that show this lion with the head of a king and wings all over the place. So we know that this first kingdom is Babylon. So we move on. It says, And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, and it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. So that would be Medo-Persia. Remember from last week's sermon, the arms of silver, that's Medo-Persia. And it's interesting, the bear is up on one side. And so uh, if we look at history, we find out that the Persians came up first. But they weren't quite powerful enough, so the Medes joined them, and they became a joint empire. And what about the three ribs in its mouth? Well, the Bible actually does not interpret those three ribs. And so it could be possibly um, the fact that it conquered Lydia, Egypt, and Libya. Those are the then known three territories that they conquered after they came into power. 
But again, the Bible doesn't say that. This is just a, a speculation as to what it could mean. Then it says, after this I looked and there was another, like a leopard, verse 6, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given unto it. And you're pretty much figuring how this is going now. You're getting the picture. The next kingdom was Greece, just like the statue of last week. But you notice something interesting. This one has four wings. And wings in Bible prophecy uh, usually depicts speed. It often talks about angels and angels with their wings and how fast they, they can swiftly move. And, and interestingly enough, if you compare Greece to Babylon, Babylon had two wings and Greece had four wings. And, and so the double amount, um, that's because under the swift arm of Alexander the Great, uh, Greece conquered um, the entire then known world in a very short amount of time. And unfortunately for Alexander, he drank himself to death at the young age of 32. And then his kingdom was divided amongst his uh, army generals because he didn't have any children. And they was divided into four. Hence, the four heads of the leopard. Isn't this, isn't this amazing that God would give these symbols ahead of time so that we could trust in him. We could trust that he knows the future. But if you think this is amazing, just wait. We've got a ways to go. Uh, but the next one here <clears throat> gets a little juicier. It says, after this, verse 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. There's a link to the iron legs of the, of the, of the statue that we studied last week. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it because it had ten horns. I was considering the horns. Oh, I'm going to stop there. Let's just, let's just see what this means so far. Um, basically, you, you're kind of following the pattern now. This was Rome. Uh, Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD. And this is a great description of this dreadful, dreadful beast and dreadful kingdom with iron teeth. And Rome is still known today as the Iron Monarchy. And uh, that destroyed everything in its path. They were cruel and heartless, treating anyone who was not a Roman citizen as basically worse than dirt. They perfected the art of crucifixion that was actually invented by the Phoenicians. And then ultimately, that's the kingdom under which Jesus died on a cross in 31 AD. We want to concentrate on this beast because of the ten horns. And... We know that there's a link to what we studied last week as well. This beast has ten horns, and the statue had ten toes. No coincidence here. Just our loving God warning us of what is to come. So we didn't get any more details on these toes last week when we looked at Daniel chapter 2. But this one's going to give us a lot more information. Because it says, if we read... Uh, if you read in verse 24, it says, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings. And if we read in verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one. So we have these ten horns, yet we have this other little horn. So the ten horns are the ten kings that we talked about last week. We talked about how the northern tribes came down and they took over the kingdom of, of Rome. And from that point on, Rome would never be, the world would never be ruled or that area of the world would never be ruled again by one kingdom. It was divided into ten. And the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Visigoths, the Suevis, the, the Burg the, all, all of those guys up there that you see. Uh, and then we know, we know them today as the Germans, Swiss, French, Italians, English, Portuguese, and Spanish, and three of them were uh, extinct, uh, were taken out. And so uh, let's find out a little bit more about that and see uh, what the Bible has uh, to say about that. Because from this moment on, we are, char we are in uncharted territory. Now we're leaving the Daniel 2. It hasn't given us any more information but now Daniel 7 is expounding on this. And this is something that Daniel actually wanted to know. So it says in verse 8, I was considering the horns, 
and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Then is looking at the ten horns that we just talked about. And it says, there came up another horn, a little horn, a little kingdom with a ruler, a man. Among all of these countries that you see up there now comes up another kingdom. A little kingdom pops up. And when it does, it destroys three of the ten. The question is, who is this little kingdom? Because it seems like the power has shifted from these four kingdoms to now this little kingdom that has eyes of a man in a mouth that speaks boastful things. But before we get into this, um, let me just say this. You can probably just Google right now the kingdom Huraly and Goths and Ostrogoths, and you'll find out what kingdom destroyed them. This is not, this is, this is, this is not mysterious. Uh, you might have even learned this in, in your world history class that you took some years ago. Or you might even know who the little horn is. But before I even have to say this, that you're going to find out a lot about this little kingdom. And you're going to see that it does some amazing things. And what's even more mind-boggling is that this little horn that we're about to study is the same exact kingdom as the beast of Revelation 13. The beast that we read in Revelation 14 that says don't worship it, don't bow down to its image, don't worship its image, and don't receive its mark. So we have to be very careful here because when we identify one, we actually identify the other, the one that we are not to worship and receive its mark and worship its image. By the time I'm done today, I won't even have to identify this kingdom. You will be able to identify it for yourself. That's how precise God is. And remember, this vision was given 2,600 years ago. So let's begin. Again, we read in verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first ones were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words well hint number one we know where geogra geographically where it comes from it says it came up from among them them is who the ten horns the kingdoms in europe so we know that this kingdom had to come up in europe number two it says that if this little it says when it says if this little kingdom came up after because that's what it says in verse 24 it says um Verse 24, the ten horns like ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. Therefore, when was Rome conquered? We learn it was from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. So this little kingdom, this little power, had to arise after 476 A.D. I'm about to go through ten identifying marks of this little horn, all from the Bible. So number one, came from Europe. Number two, had to come after 476 AD. Now, it says another little horn, a little kingdom. You have to keep that in mind, that this is probably the smallest kingdom in Western Europe. It is smaller than the other ones. It is different. It is a little horn that comes up amongst the ten big horns. So this is a little kingdom in Western Europe. Europe, you're probably already finding out who this is. And so number four is this, before whom three kingdoms were uprooted or plucked up or destroyed. Oh, we know who these are, the Hurali, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. 
And we can know from our study of world history who this is, so I'm going to let you figure this one out. And so then he also talked about the fact that he had the eyes and the mouth of a man, which means that there's a man at the head of this kingdom. All other kingdoms in Western Europe had kings and queens, and, but this one only has a man. Daniel sees the eyes and the mouth of this man. Never is there a woman or a queen in this kingdom. This is a dead giveaway as to who, what the identity of this power is. And then it says, he shall be diverse. In verse 24, Daniel 7, verse, he shall be diverse from the first ones. The king and kingdom will be different from the first ten. All the kingdoms in Western Europe are the same, except for one. You have France, you have England, Germany, Italy, Portugal. They're all the same. Simple democratic kingdoms, kings and queens have uh, flooded their history, have been at the heads of for centuries. There's nothing unique, but there's one kingdom in Western Europe, one that is totally different. It doesn't have a democratic system in this kingdom. The people of this kingdom don't vote for anything, and a man is the head of the system that votes for everything. There's only one kingdom, not democratic, not political. If you don't know this by now, it's getting more and more obvious. And verse 25 of Daniel chapter 7 says, He shall speak pompous words, just like we read in Daniel 7 verse 8. He speaks pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. He shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Uh, some Bibles say words of blasphemy. Um, pompous words or words of blasphemy. If you read the King James, that's what it actually says. So what is blasphemy? Um, interestingly enough, we don't have to guess at this either. Go to John chapter 10. Go to John chapter 10 and you go to verse 30 to 33. So John is the fourth book in the New Testament. One of Jesus' disciples. And he wrote in John chapter 10 verse 30 to 33. This is a story that involves Jesus, and uh, there's a discussion that happens here. It says, I and my father are one, in verse 30. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone Jesus. And Jesus answered to them and says, Many good works have I shown you from my father. For which of those do you stone me? They were about to throw stone and kill him because he says, I and my father are one. And the Jews answered to him and said, For a good work we do not stone you but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So blasphemy simply means to claim to be God or to be one with God. I mean, Jesus came to this earth as a little baby, as part of the Godhead. He was there before creation, as part of the Trinity. Uh, he can most definitely call himself God. I mean, it even says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, you know, became flesh and dwelt among us, talking about Jesus. So, this might strike a sensitive chord with some people watching here this morning, but apparently the man at the head of, of this little kingdom claims to be God's representative on earth. We are dealing with a religious power. That's why Revelation 13 tells us that the whole world will worship and follow this beast, this kingdom, this king. Now this is a dead giveaway. There's only one kingdom in Europe where a man claims to be God's representative on earth. But there's more. If you go to Mark chapter 2, there's another <clears throat> uh, description of what blasphemy is. If you go to Mark chapter 2, verses 5 to 6, very interesting. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, this is a story of, of a, a couple of friends who brought down... Um, their friend through a rooftop and lowered him through a rooftop in a house where Jesus was. They didn't have access to the house. It was just everywhere Jesus went, there was thousands of people who wanted to see him, touch him, hear him. And so they took the towels off the roof and they brought him down uh, on a sheet so that Jesus could see him. And Jesus says, when Jesus saw their faith, 
he said to this paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So here again we have a Bible interpretation of what constitutes great words and blasphemy. When a man claims to be able to forgive sins, which is something that only God can do, you know that they are being blasphemous. Jesus, again, is the Son of God. He's part of the Trinity. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for our sins. He's the only one who can. Uh, God is the only one who can forgive our sins because of what Jesus has done. But a man can't do that. No man has died for you. And even if they did, they wouldn't be worthy of forgiving you your sins because that man was sinful too. This is another, another dead giveaway. There's only one man in one kingdom in Western Europe who claims to be able to do this. But there's more, right? It says uh, under 8, it says it will wear out and war against God's people or against the saints. It would persecute God's people. If you go back to um, Daniel chapter 7 and uh, verse 25 and also in verse 21, it, it describes this even better. It says, um, I was watching and the same one, verse 21, was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Uh, some Bibles use the word persecution. They, this power would persecute God's people. As you study history all the way back from Jesus' time to the present day, what kingdom is responsible for putting millions and millions and millions of martyrs to their death? Most of which were very good Christian people. There's only one. What kingdom did all the crusades against humanity, the Spanish Inquisition, uh, they used the guillotine. Um, the time wasn't called the Dark Ages for nothing. Only one kingdom is responsible for this. And it would say, it says further down in verse 25, it shall intend to change times and laws. Uh, it's not talking about months or, or, or hours. Or, it, it's, this is talking about... Um, Times and laws. It's talking about God's law. We know God's law can't be changed. I mean, we're, we're trying to do that now in the world. And look what kind of mess we're in. We don't follow the word of God. We don't follow the law of God. And so we're in a mess. Environmentally, socially, politically, morally. I mean, the Bible says, till heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot and not one tittle shall in no way pass from my law. But this power is going to attempt or try to change God's law in times. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And we also actually know how long this power would rule. This is amazing. It tells us uh, the, at the end of 25, then the saints shall be given into his hands. So this persecution, the saints shall be given into his hands. This persecution time that we're talking about is going to last for a time, times, and half a time. <laughs> I know, that just, that's crystal clear, right? <laughs> it just totally makes sense. I know it doesn't, but let's look a little deeper because I think, I think your eyes may be open to something here. This is absolutely, absolutely amazing that the Bible will actually predict how long this power would rule. Go to Revelation. Go to Revelation, and, and, and this is where I start to get excited a little bit because, you know, I, this, this Word of God, this Bible, has, has been the light uh, unto my feet. It has, been, it has been the lamp unto my feet and a light, un a light unto my path. And I cannot not trust it. After reading things like this and seeing how God is, is, is leading, has been leading the world, I, I have no other choice. If you go to Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 12, it gives us the exact same time in three different ways. Go to Revelation chapter 12 and we verse 14. Uh, Revelation 
chapter 12, verse 14, it says, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Folks, next week, we're going to rip Revelation 12, 12 apart. We're going to look at this and what it all means. But for now, you're going to have to trust me that I mean, obviously it's the same. It's this time, times, and half a time. And it's talking about the woman who's going to be led in the desert, in the wilderness. And so we're talking about a, something that this woman is experiencing that's difficult, just like we talked about the fact in, in Daniel chapter 7 that it's going to be persecuting for time, times, and half a time. But there's more to it than that. If you go up to verse, um, it says in verse um, 6 of Revelation chapter 12, it says, then the woman fled into the wilderness. It's talking about the same thing that we read uh, in the earlier verse. It says, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. Crystal clear now, right? No, okay. All right, so check this out. Follow me carefully. Write this on a piece of paper if you have to. Because, you know, for those of you who are math whiz, this is going to be, this is going to blow your mind. Time is one year. Times is two years. And half a time is half a year. Just follow me on this. So that's one plus two plus a half. Gives us three and a half years. You're following me so far. Okay. Now, if you multiply this by 12, because there's 12 months in a year, that'll give you the amount of months. That leads us to 42 months. How many days are in 42 months? If you do 30 days a year, 30 days a month, that leads us to exactly 1260 days. Crystal clear, right? <laughs> no. Okay, I know. I know. Let's just follow me. Don't miss the part. The next part. In prophecy, we deal in symbols, right? So everything in prophecy is symbolic. For example, waters are people, nations, and tongues. We also understood that a beast is a king or a kingdom or a king in his kingdom. Uh, a horn is the same thing. We also understood that a day, a day equals what? In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 4, verse 6, it tells us that a day equals a year. So we have another prophetic symbol in the Bible here, that a day equals a year. You can only apply this to prophecy. For example, in creation, when it says God created the heaven and the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh day, that's literally six days. Not 6,000 years or six years or it's six days. It says it was morning and evening. So there's no, there's no questioning that. But in prophecy, when you're dealing with times and years uh, they, uh, or days, they symbolize a year. So check this out. Three and a half years equals 42 months, which equals 1,260 days. One more thing. Bear with me. Revelation 13, verse 5. Just a page over. Revelation 13, verse 5. It says, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. This is talking about the beast of Revelation 13. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. <laughs> this is talking about the same authority, the same entity, Using the same amount of time. 42 months. Time, times and half a time. Three and a half years. And 1260 days. 1260 years. This power. Would have the authority to persecute. For 1260 years. So here you have it. All 10 identifying marks of the little horn. You have the 10 marks given to you straight from the Bible. I haven't made anything up. I haven't used any other resources. 
I am simply using the Bible to interpret itself. There's no private interpretation that I've made this this morning. This is what I call the living word of God. And God says, I'm going to make this so clear for you, you will not be able to miss it. This is not Francis speaking, but God revealing this to you this morning. And most of you have already guessed who this little kingdom is by now. But before we identify it, like all other kingdoms that have ever been on the earth, it had some sad chapters. I mean, our Canadian history is riddled with sad chapters. Americans, Nigerians, Colombians, you name it. All nations have sad chapters. Years they wish they could forget. And just because we're all part of a nation or nations with rotten history doesn't necessarily make us bad citizens. None of that has to do with me. In the same way, this kingdom has a rotten history that doesn't make you a bad person because you're part of that kingdom. Let me give you another example. Perhaps some of you who are watching this morning or close to this, af this afternoon are Germans. I mean, the German kingdom did some pretty rotten things. They, you know, they, they started a world war that killed millions of people and not to mention the Holocaust. Does that make German people bad? No. German people are, are some of the nicest and smartest people I, I've ever met. Uh, so I want us to make sure that we understand what's going on here. It's because we've built this bridge, this little bridge. What kingdom is the little horn power? You got it. It's papal Rome or the Vatican City. And let me pause right here and I want you to listen to me very carefully. God is not bringing this out in order to hurt people or to offend people. There is something that we have to clarify that is very important. In the Bible, God prophesies the future. He brings out events and kingdoms and so on. He brings out powers and rulers. And he shows their effect on history and, and on those who claim to be his followers. For example, you had Babylon, Medo-Persia. You know, still in Greek, which still has a huge influence on us today. Rome, you know, built roads and established the rule of law. And we still live by a lot of that today. So folks, the next power... The next power is simply a power that came out of the pagan Roman Empire and became the Papal Rome Empire or the Vatican City. Or Papal Rome or sometimes people uh, refer to it as the Holy Roman Empire. And according to God, the next power to come on the scene because he's simply predicting the future is the Holy Roman Empire. And here's what I want us to realize this morning. We have to see the difference between the kingdom of papal Rome and the Catholic Church and its people. Those are two totally separate issues. God is not talking about the Catholic Church and its wonderfully devout people. God here is talking about a kingdom, a horn, a little horn or a beast of Revelation 13 that, is a, that symbolizes a power on this earth. Often we get these two things confused. I was born in a Catholic home. I, I went to grade five and six and I was taught by nuns. And, and my parents raised me with good moral values. They weren't Christians. They weren't, they weren't Seventh-day Adventists. They were Catholics. And they gave me good moral values. We didn't go to church that much. But I, 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 I was raised in a good home. Well, I have to say that grade six was a little tough for me <laughs> because the Catholic nun who taught us, she liked to throw dictionaries to discipline us. And so sometimes we'd have to dodge uh, very, very, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, I learned a lot. And, and then, you know, there's priests and, priests and nuns all over the world who give their life and sacrificial service all over the world. They've built schools. They've built hospitals. They have helped people all over the world. I want to be clear. God is not talking about the Catholic Church or its people. He is bringing out the kingdom of papal Rome and its impact 
on the world. And history does not deny what the Bible has foretold. This is, we're just scratching the surface. You're going to see, you're going to be amazed. You're going to be amazed. So we don't need to be bashing anyone today. There won't be any Catholics, Baptists, Muslims, or Adventists in heaven. But rather those who long to live in heaven, barrier free through the, his love and the grace of our loving Savior. What I hope that I can accomplish through these presentations is for all of us to put aside our denominational barriers and to let the truth of the Bible speak loud and clear to all of us, wherever we are, whatever you believe, so that we can unite together in the truth of this word. That's all that matters. The truth of this word in the love of Jesus Christ. So now that we know who we are talking about, I want to go back through these 10 points and talk about some of these identifying marks more in detail. Um, point number one, among them, among the 10 European nations, and we have the Vatican City that's right there in the heart of Europe, in the middle of Italy. It fits perfectly with that point of coming up among the 10. And number two, it says, after 476 A.D. I'm going to show you in a couple of weeks a huge 75 foot long painting right in the Vatican of the Emperor Justinian giving the Bishop of Rome the seat of power with the following date right on the painting. 538 A.D. Papal Rome, pagan Rome became Papal Rome. In 538 AD. And it became a Christian empire. Justinian actually got off of his throne. And he gave his throne to the Pope. On that date. Exactly as it was prophesied. After 476 AD. A little more than 50 years. After Papal, pagan Rome fell to the northern tribes. Number three. The little horn means a little kingdom. You know the Vatican City only occupies 109 acres of land in the heart of Italy. The smallest of all the kingdoms in Western Europe. Did you know that it is the single wealthiest kingdom in the world today? Even though it's one of the smallest. It is wealthier than Switzerland with all of its banks. Wealthier than South Africa with all of its diamonds. And it's wealthier than Saudi Arabia with all of its oil. And then number four, we've talked about, uprooted the three kingdoms. You can look it up as well. There were three Aryan nations who opposed the uprising of Papal Roman Empire. And so the papal authority quickly destroyed these three authorities uh, with their army. And interestingly enough, the last one to be destroyed was destroyed in 538 AD. And after that time, the rest of the horns fell under the spell of papal Rome. And it says a man, right? Number five, a man is at its head. A man is at its head. Who is that man even to this day? The Pope. He has been the face of many magazine covers. And now we have Pope Francis. Of all names to have, his name is Francis. And he is a Pope who encourages piety and encourages simple living. And he cares for the less fortunate. But it's always been a visible man. Never a woman. Always a visible man. No one else makes decisions but him. He speaks for the, the kingdom. And he makes decisions for the kingdom. He is the head. He is a man. And no one ever represents the church publicly. But the Pope. This also Fulfills that identification. I mean, number six is it is diverse. It is different from the other kingdoms. I talked about that already. Um, every kingdom is political. This one is ecclesiastical in Europe. And yet it sits also amidst the politicians to help them make decisions. Number seven. It speaks great words and blasphemy. I want to be sensitive this afternoon 
as we talk about this. I have done quite a bit of research about this over the years, and so has a man by the name of Leo Shriven, to who I owe most of this information that I'm about to share with you. And you may remember that we had discussed from the Bible that blasphemy is either claiming to be God or be able to forgive sins. So I'd like to show you a few quotes um, today from the archives of the Vatican Library. It's called Prompta Bibliotheca, which is the official Catholic dictionary, or in English it's called Ferrari's Ecclesiastical Library. And uh, if you look under the letter P uh, for Pope, this is what it will tell you. It says, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. The Pope is called most holy because he is rightfully presumed to be such. He is likewise the divine monarch and supreme emperor and king of kings. Hence, the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Now, next week, this is, this is kind of funny. Next week, I will actually show you a picture of that triple crown. It cost my friend Leo Scriven $250 US to take a picture of that crown behind a glass. He actually bribed a priest to allow him to go upstairs where no one else was allowed to go. And the priest took the 250 bucks and he put him in a robe and <laughs> he went upstairs and took a picture of that and many other things that I will show you along the way. But he took a picture of that crown and some of the things that are on that crown are going to blow your mind. And it continues on. It says, moreover, the superiority of and the power of the Roman pontiff by no means pertain only to heavenly things, to earthly things, and to things under the earth, but are even over angels than, than whom he is greater. So that if it were possible that the angels might err in the faith, or might think contrary to the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. The Pope can excommunicate angels. It says, the Pope is as it were God on earth. So sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief king of kings, having Plenitude and power. The Sevilla Catholica also says this. The Pope is the supreme judge of the law of the land. He is the vice regent of Christ and is not only a priest forever, but also king of king and lord of lords. All of these, all of these quotes are from books that have been stamped in the Catholic library as being official documents. I'm not making any of this thing up. The Catholic National says, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. What a claim. What a claim. By the man at the head of this little kingdom, spoken of by in Daniel and Revelation. In all sensitivity and based on many Canadian Catholics that I've spoken to, most Canadian Catholics don't necessarily believe in all of this anymore. 90% of churches in North America, Catholic churches, don't necessarily teach this anymore. And as the information highway has progressed over the years, very few believe, people believe in this anymore. However, it is still in every encyclopedia, in every catechism, and in every Catholic publication, it is still there as an official doctrine. And if you go to certain places in the world, like, like the Philippines, or you go to Romania, or in Brazil, people believe this with their life. What about the part of forgiving sins? 
I had to do it when I was Catholic. I remember the first time I walked into that dark brown box and I sat down and I heard a and then some voice spoke to me. It felt so weird. And you know, many sincere Catholics do this with all their hearts. They're great people who love God and love their church. In 2000, there's a quote from Pope John Paul. He says, Rebuting a belief widely shared by Protestants and a growing numbers of Roman Catholics, Pope John Paul II on Tuesday dismissed the, quote, widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God and exhorts Catholics to confess more often to their priests. As you can see, as of 2000, this is still a very strong teaching in the Catholic Church. If you read on, in Joseph de Varby's Catechism in page 279, it says, The priest does really and truly forgive sins in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. And in another book, this is uh, Michael Mueller is the one who wrote the book by which priests in the Catholic Church are trained. And on page 78 and 79 of the Catholic priest, it says, Seek where you will, through heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. The extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priests. Yes, beloved brethren, the priest raises his hands. He pronounces the words of absolution, and in an instant, quick as a flash of light, the chains of hell are burst asunder and the sinner becomes a child of God. So great is the power of the priest that the judgments of heaven itself are subject to his decision. Folk, it just, it just breaks my heart. I want to say something to you right now. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. And we're going to learn that when it comes to the sins of your life and the mistakes that you've made and the shame and the guilt that you may carry, you don't need anyone to see, intercede between you and God. All you need is to humbly confess and speak to Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. The Bible even says that we can boldly come before the throne of grace and you can confess your sins to God and God alone. He alone can forgive your sins. The Bible says there's only one meteor between you and God and that's your Savior, Jesus Christ. And He loves you so much that He's willing to take on your sins and become sin so that you can be free. You have a straight line to your Father in heaven. And He loves you. And He wants to make you whole. We have to move on. It talks about wearing out. Number eight, wearing out and warring against God's people. I don't like to talk about this, but again, uh, it reveals God's wisdom to prophecy. That's, this is why He put it there. Not to point, not to, for people to hate, not for people, but just because this is what would happen. And it happened. You know, I don't know the exact number, but history books tell us that between 50 to 60 million martyrs died during the Dark Ages. 50 to 60 million people. No other kingdom ever comes near to this but the Roman Catholic power. We all know that pilgrims arrived in Plymouth in the United States. Well, it wasn't the United States then. It was an unknown kingdom because they were fleeing. 
They were fleeing persecution in Europe. So they wanted to establish a kingdom that would be free. That would allow people freely to worship. And they had a reason to flee. I mean, a lot of their relatives and their friends were put into arenas to be eaten by animals. They were burnt at the stake. Uh, they were, hot oil was poured down their throats. They were stretched. They would tie four horses and tie to their arms and their legs. And they would tear them apart and for the pleasure of people to see. They created a, they were cruel, cruel, cruel people. Because they didn't believe in what the church taught. I, I'm only saying this because we have to take an honest look at history and how it is fulfilled in the books. But then I found something interesting. In 1994, we saw a lot of articles coming out in the papers. In 1994, the Pope issued a letter to all Christian churches. And in that letter, he issued, it was 71 pages. It was issued in, in November 15, 1994. Here's an excerpt from those 71 pages. It says, the Roman Catholic Church must mark the year 2000 by acknowledging its members' sins, including intolerance in the name of religion and complicity in human rights crimes. As the second millennium draws to a close, the church should become more fully conscious of the sinfulness of her children, recalling all those times in history when they departed from the spirit of Christ. And it goes on, this, and the letter goes on to acknowledge things like the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, and martyrs that died through the centuries. Basically admitting of its wrongs and not acting like Jesus would have asked them to act. So here's what I have to say this afternoon. If the Pope has asked on behalf of the kingdom of papal Rome to forgive them for all the wrongs and all the martyrs, then friends, we who believe in a forgiving God have to forgive them. The Bible says, forgive lest you be forgiven. Friends, we can't just take the Bible and apply it to the things that work for us. Somebody has asked for forgiveness. We must willingly give it. And number nine talks about the change of times and laws. This one is amazing. I mean, I studied catechism when I was a child and because I was taught it when I was younger. And while visiting Niagara on the lake here in Ontario, which is a beautiful place to visit, by the way, my wife and I were walking down the street and there was this church there and they were selling books. And I bought this book. Uh, it was called the Catechism. It was a Catholic church. I bought this old book at a yard sale. And there's something interesting that I found in that book when we're talking about point number nine, thinking to change times and laws. There's a chapter in the book, uh, uh, in, in this book, that talks about the law of God. On page 48, there was something very interesting. And it said something, and I think I thought I had it. Yeah, right here, I took a picture of it. You probably won't be able to see it. But it says, what is the second commandment? I can point it right there, but uh, what is the second commandment? This is the book that I purchased on a yard sale. And it says, the second commandment is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And I kind of said, wait a minute. That's actually not. The, that's, that's, that's not, that's not the, 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 that's not the second commandment. It says, those of you who read your Bible and you know it, what is the second commandment? It says, thou shalt not make unto you any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You say, well, what happened? You open up any, any Bible and it's going to have that as the second commandment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only kingdom and the only power in the world that has thought to change God's law. It actually removed the second commandment from the Bible. It has been completely taken out out of the catechism. I don't care what catechism you look at. Go to any library. Uh, you look at the second commandment. It is completely gone. 
And the, re the reason is obvious, of course, because the statues and the images and the relics that all Catholic churches are inundated with, people pray to Mary, pray to the statue, people kiss the toe of Peter when they go to the Basilica, it, all kinds of different things. These, these, these statues are, are, are worshipped and prayed to. That's why it was removed. And it's interesting, the 10th commandment, the way, I mean, I read on in the book, and that I had, and it talks about and it, and it, what it's done, and it says, you know, the tenth commandment says, "Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods," and in the ninth commandment, it says, "Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife." So they basically took one commandment, and split it into two, so that we can still have ten. And those are good commandments; they're true, uh, but they've removed one because it works for how they practice. I mean, the ninth commandment says, "Thou shalt not lie." Thou shalt not bear false witness. So in order to keep the list of ten, they split the tenth one into two. There is no power in the world. No power in the world that has thought to change God's law. Only the kingdom of papal Rome. By the way, there's a lot more. <laughs> but uh, I can't tell you all of it this morning. It's going to blow you away. Um, when we'll see the, the fulfillment of the ninth identifying mark. There's a lot more to this than that. But the last identifying mark, the Bible says it's going to rule for a time, times and half a time. We talked about 42 months, talked about 1260 days. And we've understood now that those actually tabulate to 1260 years. God never misses. He is so precise. There's absolutely the sure word. We can be confident like we said earlier. But this last part here is actually quite dramatic. That God could pinpoint to the year the ruling of this power. So when did papal Rome begin to rule again? That's correct. 538 AD. And we talked about earlier about Ezekiel. We talked about this in Ezekiel 4 verse 6. That you've given you a day for a year. Therefore a day equals a year in prophecy. Um, and so... You can look it up in any history book or you can Google it. I've got some quotes for you here. That when the papal authorities became a political power, it began to rule in Rome. It says here, Vigilus ascended the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. This is a history of Christian church, volume 3, page 327. God says it's going to rule for 1260 years to the very year the prophecy was fulfilled. So let's do a little math. If you do 538 AD, when the Pope began to rule, the papal empire began to rule, and you add 1260 years to that, what does that take you? 538 plus 1260 takes us to exactly 1798. 1798 AD. Is there anything significant as far as this prophecy is concerned, that happened in 1798 A.D. Well, as a matter of fact, something did happen in Europe in 1798 A.D. And there's another quote from, another, from the Encyclopedia of Americana. It says, in 1798, he, Berthier, which is a French general, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. Isn't that amazing? That to the year, God predicted when this little horn would begin to rule and when it would be stopped. History tells us that in 1798, the French went into Rome, confiscated all the properties of the church, declared a republic, and declared that the Pope would never rule again. In fact, they grabbed the Pope, they brought him to France, they put him in jail, and he died in a, in a jail cell there in France. And for many, many years, there wasn't even a pope in Rome. It was not really, literally not until 1929 when Mussolini of the then communist Italy set up the Vatican again as a political state. That it had the same power once again that it had before. And remember we read in the Bible that it would receive a deadly wound that would heal. This is what it's talking about. That papal Rome would become in power again. And it only took 31 years for that to happen. 
This was predicted 1,100 years before. You have history match prophecy to the year. Now you see, Francis, what does this have to do with the beast of Revelation 13? The one that we started with, sorry, an hour ago. Man, I'm going so long. I'm almost done. It says, notice the parallel. Um, so this is talking about this again. Sorry, the slide. 1798, uh, 1260 years, 1260 days. Pope Pius VI was imprisoned by Napoleon. And, and, the, and the Emperor Justinian put a decree and gave, put him into power. So uh, if, we look at, if you look at Revelation chapter 13, um, if you go quickly there and you go to verse 5, it says, <clears throat> and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. That sounds like a link to me to what we just talked about. He was going to the authority to continue for 42 months. So again, 1260 years. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name as tabernacle and those who dwell on the earth. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, nation, and tongue. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Folks, the beast that is the beast that is the exact same thing as the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. And the horn, the beast that God tells us not to worship, not to bow down to, and not to receive its mark. The papal kingdom, 23 times in the book of Revelation, God tells us don't worship this feast, don't worship the image, and don't receive the mark. Speaking of the papal Roman Empire. So there's one last step. Again, we go back to Revelation 13. We talked about the beast that had the head of a lion, the feet of a bear, the body of a leopard, and it had the horns. What does that have to do with anything, this composite beast? Why would the papal Roman Empire be made up of these four other pagan kingdoms that preexisted it? Not only that, but if you look at verse 2, it says, Now the beast which I saw was like leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Who is this dragon? And it even tells us later on that there's a number to this beast, and the number is 666. Ladies and gentlemen, what is going on? Who is the man behind this beast whose number is 666? And I would love to give you all the answers to this, but you have to kind of come back next Saturday where we can talk about some. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna better understand what all of this means and what Revelation 12 and 13 have to say about this beast. And I want you to know that for those of you who are watching, if you have friends and family that you want them to watch um, they can also watch it in French and Spanish. You just go to our website and uh, www.reallyliving.ca and they can click Spanish or French. So if you want some of your friends to watch this, they may not speak English. They can actually watch it in those languages. But I promise you that you're going to get all the answers to those questions that I just brought up uh, next week as we meet. So let me say this as I close. Many of the Catholics get pretty excited that they are in Bible prophecy. And even though it does reveal some of the bad things of the past, they get excited. And oftentimes, uh, our Protestant friends feel left out. I know that's a bummer, right? In fact, I find sometimes that Protestants uh, feel a little bit smug. They'll say, Francis, none of this affects me. I don't worship the beast. Protestants, I want to ask you a question this morning. I don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Dutch Reform, Assemblies of God, Adventist, Episcopalian, you name it. You may not be worshiping the beast. That may be true. But here's a question for you. Are you worshiping the image of the beast? You better believe it. And you better get your pastors and your friends and your relatives to watch next week because... This is a matter of eternal life. Protestants are far more involved in this issue than any Catholic could ever be. 
Catholics are way ahead of Protestants when it comes to getting in trouble with this one. Believe me. And now you may not be a Catholic. You may not be a Protestant. You may not believe in the Bible. You may not go to church. And I want you to know that you're involved in this more than Protestants and Catholics combined. You may be receiving the mark of the beast and not even know it. Because it says in Revelation 13 verse 3, all the world wondered and followed after the beast. This means you could be sitting in your home right now watching this and you could be following the beast. You could be worshiping it and you could have the mark of it and you don't even know it. This is why I'm preaching this and I've told all my family and friends to get on board because I don't want anybody to tell me when the times are going to get rough. Francis, you knew this and you never told me? You knew about these things and you kept it to yourself? I know that by preaching this right now, by sharing these presentations, some of you are upset. Some of you may be angry. Some of you may be uh, so distraught with unbelief or struggling with what you're hearing. I have to share this with you because I want you to know what the Lord has put in my heart and what the Lord has revealed. And not just to me. It's not even to me. I'm not, I'm not showing you anything here that's not been proven by the Bible. I want to share one last point. I know I keep saying this. Did you know that this exact message that I share with you today, every Protestant church in this city and in every city in North America, they preached it 50 years ago. But you don't hear it anymore. Take, for example, the Lutherans, the wonderful people. Uh, Martin Luther uh, is the reason that we can call ourselves Protestants today. And in his library, we found 30 sermons that say word for word what I just shared with you today. 30 sermons. Yet, you don't hear it anymore. What about the Methodist? John Wesley is your founder. His entire works is made up of 23 volumes. In his 23 volumes, 11 sermons are word for word what I shared today. Yet, you won't hear those sermons anymore in the Methodist church today. Doesn't that concern you? What about Pentecostals? You gotta love their charisma. The Pentecostal movement was born out of the holiness movement in the 1800s. And their fuel was these very prophecies that we're talking about today. And all of their old famous preachers, one of them is Oral Roberts, you may have heard of him. All those men used to preach word for word what I just shared with you today. But you will not hear a sermon like this in the Pentecostal church today anymore. Presbyterians, their founding father was Calvin. Thousands of sermons, and many of which are exactly what I shared with you today. Do you think something is going on? It begs one question. If you're not hearing what I've shared with you today, what are you hearing? I'll tell you what you're hearing you're hearing, we're all going to be secretly raptured. And after rapture, there's going to be a tribulation that come. I sure hope that my loved ones and everybody else that doesn't accept what I told them, I sure hope that they're saved. And in the middle of that week, there'll be a, a, an antichrist that's going to come. And then you're, you're, you know, I'm, who, it doesn't matter because I'm not going to be there anyways because none of this stuff applies to me. I'm going to be secretly raptured. That's what most of the denominations are teaching today. Don't worry about the beast, about worshiping, or about the mark. We will be secretly raptured. Isn't that sweet? Sweet, but deadly. I want you to know that every single one of us here today is involved in the book of Revelation. So don't miss next week. So we're going to learn about how we can make a choice on how we can be on Jesus' side Versus being on the Antichrist side. The sermon for next week is going to be entitled, The Perfect Disguise. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the time to dig into your word today. And to see your word come alive as you are warning every single human being who is watching this today 
to look for these signs and to be aware of these signs. The book of Revelation is a book that reveals both the love of Jesus Christ and the deception of the Antichrist. So, Father, guide us. As we go about our week this week, may we go back and listen to this sermon. Look at the verses so we can know for ourselves that we are not being led astray, but that the Bible is actually guiding us every step of the way. And next week when we get back together and study the book of Revelation chapter 12 and we unravel more of the mysteries that will make more sense to us, may we confirm our commitment to living by this word and this word alone. Because it tells us that it will set us free. We may not know that we're not free. But pretty soon we're going to find out. If all the world is going to follow and marvel after this beast. That has for a leader the dragon. I want to make sure that I'm on the right side. And I want to make sure that everybody that I know and love and everybody that I don't know and don't love yet can be made aware of this so they can be ready when you come to take them home. In your name I pray. Amen.